Hey everybody out there in Radio Land, this is Pete Rollick, Lovecraftian author with new stuff to shill. You're listening to Legends of Tabletop. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Pete. Pete. <laughs> Welcome everybody. This is the Legends of Tabletop podcast. I'm happy to have Pete Rollick on with me tonight. It's been a little while since we've had John. How's it going, sir? It's you know I can't complain. I mean I could, but I won't. But yeah, you know. I mean, it's, we did off air a little. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but no, I have you. Know, things are going good. You know, I'm working. You know, and I'm producing, and you know, the creativity juices are flowing. Things are going good. I I burned two thousand words today, and then I wrote two thousand words. So you know, oh, it, it all works out. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah. You know, you sit down and you're like, this is. You look at what you did yesterday, and it's like, this is utter crap. And you, you just rip it all out, and then you're like, okay, what am I going to do that makes me actually happy to write this story? And then you, you you put your butt in the chair, and you bleed onto the keys, and then, and somehow magically it happens. And then you go back and you salvage those 2,000 words and shove them back in, and <laughs> all of a sudden it makes sense. And, and that's really the thing, right? I mean, that's the key is, is to actually get in the chair and sit down and, and – do the hard work, you know, quote unquote. It is the hardest part, uh, um, you know, because the world is full of stuff that I would rather do. That stuff that I, you know, I would love to play Sudoku on my phone for four hours. No, that's not going to do anything. <laughs> I'd love to watch the next 14 episodes of The Flash, but that doesn't, you know, that doesn't work. So, well, so so how do you how do you budget then, right? So like, you got a family, you're working, you're writing, like you're you're doing all these different things, you're editing, um, like like how does that come out of the wash then, right? Because it's easy to just be like, ah, eh, I'm gonna unplug, I'm gonna watch the Flash all day today, because I do that sometimes, and then I hate myself the next day because I'm like, shit, I could have did this and this and this, and I'll pull up my list and I'm like, shit, and then I'll write ten more things down that I'm not gonna do. Mm -hmm. So 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 like, what what's the key for you to kind of like drugs? Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, hmm, what's the key? Um, you know, so I work full time, and I, you know, I have the, the family, and you know, I do seven loads of laundry on Sunday. Oof. But Sunday's a really good day to write because I'm doing laundry. So you know, it literally takes like five ten minutes to to change loads over. And then you can go back to writing. Um, the the thing is, I I have two cheats. Um, when I started to learn how to write, I was writing in a bar. Huh. So I like background noise when I write. So I can put on a crappy Netflix movie that is just that I don't really have to pay attention to, and I can write to that. So I kill two birds with one stone. Um, the problem is if it turns out to be actually something very good or something foreign, <laughs> you know, I, if it's very good, it distracts me too much. And if it's foreign, it's, it's subtitles. I can't write and read subtitles at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, um, the other cheat is that uh, I only need about four hour, four to five hours sleep a night. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, need or that's what you get? <laughs> no, that's – so during the week, you know, I'll – I'll get four to five hours sleep a night. So I'll, I'm up working and doing other stuff. And then like Friday night, I'll crash and, you know, get like 10 hours of sleep, you know? And so, but those are, I, I've always done this. And I, I used to say that I do most, I do more between the hours of midnight and 4 a.m. than most people do all day. Um, I, it's a really good time for me to write because there's no distractions. TV, right. TV is shitty um, at, at those hours. The kids are asleep. The wife is asleep. I can get some stuff done. Right. And uh, the dog is asleep too. He's like, <laughs> he's like, what are you doing? Go to sleep. No. Yeah. So yeah, um, those are good hours for me. Uh, so yeah, that's 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 the cheat that I don't sleep and. Um, I, I write while doing other stuff. 
Right. I said, I always like when I work second shift because it was sort of the same thing. I'd get, you know, I get out at midnight and get home and the, you know, the wife was asleep and, you know, the nothing like we didn't have kids. So like I would, I would write, I would, you know, dick around on the internet, you know, play video games or whatever. But like, you just like, it was quiet and you just had all the time to do whatever it was that you wanted to do. I, I get up early in the morning now too. And I hate it. I've been doing it for Oh, shit, my my kid's eighteen, so like eighteen years now, and it's it's the worst. <laughs> I get up before five; it sucks. Yeah, yeah, I I don't like that. Um, it's summer down here. It's summer, so I got summer camp, and my normal drive to work is fifteen minutes. And now oh, nice. I have to drive all the way into the city, drop the kids off at camp, and then drive all the way back out. So <laughs> it's now an hour, which I then have to make up in the evening. Um. So I'm an hour late to work and I have to stay an hour. But, you know, it, I turn off the radio and I think about what I'm writing so that when I finally get time, I know exactly what I want to do. And then you can and then you can rip it all up and then do it again. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, as Joe says, it's really hard to critique and rewrite a draft that you don't have. So just getting a draft down on paper – is, and then working from that is better than nothing. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, so yeah. Do you, do you do you ever start out with you know with an idea of of where a plot's going and a character, how that you know character is going to be, and you know sort of what their place is in the world, and then as you begin to write the characters, like no, 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 I'm not doing that. We're, I'm doing this. So so come on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so if you. have Remember in Reanimators, I bring on Professor Peasley as a, a side character to my my main character Hartwell, and he just literally starts to dominate the book. Yeah. He's a very strong personality, and he's he he's he dominates the book and he overwhelms Hartwell. And thankfully, you know, I, I got some reprieve because. He leaves the country, um, but then he's writing letters and he's like directing things. And you know, even from far away, he's seizing control of the book. And I just sat down and I wrote it. And as as, as Hartwell is like, I gotta kill this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and thankfully, there was a progression in the actual original story, The Shadow Out of Time, where there there comes a time where the the personality that's in control of Peasley leaves and i had timed it you know the the my my being fed up with peasley was right at that time so it's kind of a cheat because it was already going to happen but i really started to hate the character <laughs> uh, because he was always in control now i've brought i have other characters that i've I, you know I've, I've brought in other characters and i'm like no, I can't have this character in here. He's got to go because he will take over this story or she will take over the story and it will no longer be about what I want. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so it, they they can't go. I need a much weaker character. From You know, and I, I'm writing a story right now about an 11-year-old boy in, living in Kingsport. And, you know, I'm, I've got to be careful that I don't overwhelm this kid with with characters that he has no way of, understanding or facing right you know so I, I, i'm toning things down as i go along you know and it, it's bad enough for kids in an adult world um in in the cthulhu mythos world it's really awful yeah <laughs> to say the least um just so like uh i'm gonna i'm i'm gonna dovetail into this but it's sort of tangential um so like when we do role-playing games right yeah. I feel like, at least for me, and I, and I feel like other people are probably the same way. You always, you know, you, every character is a little piece of yourself, some some part or parcel of, you know, a, a part of you that you're either trying to work out or, or whatever it is. Um, do your characters, when you're writing, kind of work the same way? Is every character like a little piece of you, or is it like a complete opportunity to be like, yeah, if I could, if I could be that, or you know, what would it be like if? Or, or some mixture of the two. Yeah, so you know, some people have 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 suggested that Hartwell is my Mary Sue character. That Hartwell is supposed to be me in the Cthulhu Mythos, and I really 
wish that were true. <laughs> um, because I think there's some really great things about Hartwell. He 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 pursues this medical medical degree that I I gave up on very early on. So there is a bit of that. But the other thing is that Hartwell's an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> complete utter ass he's whiny he's ridiculous he he never completes anything he sets out to do i mean it, it takes him essentially 25 years to get revenge on herbert west so i would hope that you know i would do it faster than that <laughs> um so but yeah there's a little bit of me in there um and that carries over into um, the Weird Company, but in the Weird Company, the primary characters are like Asnith Waite, and, and Hartwell's still there, but um, the other characters are, are more to the forefront. And I, I, I don't think I can really relate to any of those characters. They are complete and utter fictions. Hmm. They're built up, and and you know that's actually now that I'm thinking about it. And I'll go back. That is actually how Hartwell came to be. You know, the weird, the first couple chapters of Weird Company were written first, and I really wanted to bring Herbert West into the the team, but the timeline for West didn't fit. So I said, okay, well, I'll pick a new character. I'll create my own reanimator, like a, and that's where Hartwell comes from. But then I didn't have any motivation for Hartwell. I didn't know what his backstory was. So I just started writing stories about Hartwell. And next thing you know, I've got his whole backstory is, is the novel Reanimators. Um, so it's easy to say that it, he's, he's me, but he's not, because I didn't know anything about him until I had written the novel. Right. Um, in Reanimatrix, I have two characters, um, Robert Peasley, who is the son of Professor Peasley, um, who is starts out gay, ends up being bi in the series. And then uh, Megan Halsey, whose name I stole from Reanimator in the movie, um, is uh, Professor Halsey's daughter. Um, she She's nothing like me. She's young, she's experimental, she, she's rich. Um, she's got a, a great sense of what she wants to do with her life. Um, she's an independent woman. Uh, she's fearless. Um, she's really into guns. Uh, none of that is is anything that I I pursue. So those are our characters that are very different than I am. Um, and I had to do a little bit of research and and work through some of those things with some of my friends who have some of those characteristics and traits that to help me flesh the characters out. Gotcha. That makes sense. Um, yeah. yeah. No, go ahead. No, it's like, so yeah, I, I mean, sometimes I like, it's easy to play yourself when you role play. But sometimes I want to do something completely different. And, you know, and, and really, you know, the last game I played, I think I killed everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not really what I want to do in life. I mean, sometimes, but you know, not not the people I know and care about. Right, right. Don't worry, we'll edit we'll all that out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, so going back to the, to the character, so you, you know, started off gay and and was uh, wind up being by, um, with you know, with like more of a push towards inclusion in in the weird fiction genre. And, you know, we talk about this at Necronomicon. There's panels about it, everything else. Um, do you ever get negative feedback when someone picks up the book and go, oh, like, why, like, why is this like thrown in our face? And it's like, you know, this is a representation of people in the world. Like this, mm -hmm. this is the world, right? Like, Yeah. So, you know, I, I, and I, I hope that's one of the things I did was I built Robert Peasley as a believable character. You know, some of it, some of the, you know, some of the problems he has is, you know, he's estranged from his father because he never knew his father growing up. He, um, he, you know, part of the core problem in, in the book is that he falls in love with a dead woman. Um, he picks up a murder case and begins investigating her murder. 
and going through her diaries and living in her house and going through her papers and finding out everything about her, he falls in love with her. But that's a perfectly safe romance for him because she's dead. Right. So he can build her up in his mind into anything he wants and not have to suffer any consequences because it's not real. And we, you know, everybody does this. You know, we, we, we create people that we would like rather than what they are. And it's only when we, we figure out the differences when we really can really be happy. But, you know, and then, but the problem is that she, she, she eventually shows up. <laughs> <laughs> she's, well, it's not that she's not dead. She's so, just sort of dead-ish. Right. Um, and, you know, that sort of screws his whole position. So it's like, yeah, I mean, he's perfectly happy um, being gay, um, falls in love with a dead woman, but then has to deal with the consequences of, of that issue. Uh, and I, that is not only part of Reanimatrix, but that's going to carry over into the sequel. Uh, which is done. Um, nice. Just yeah, it's uh, it's uh, called the Eldritch Equations, and um, it will deal with a, a couple more cases of uh, Peasley and uh, Megan Halsey. Cool, very cool. Yeah. Um, you've got a new book out now. Uh, it just came oh. out. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, crazy Street company and others. Yes, it's a collection of short stories. Awesome. And then this is your, your first collection, right? This is my first collection. Uh, you know, some people argue that the Peasley Papers is, is my first collection because it collects a lot of stories. But those, I, I think of that as a chronicle because it's all those stories are interrelated. Um, they all feature uh, members of the Peasley family um, or, or related to the Peasley family. And the, and it's a progression from like um, the Jurassic period all the way through the heat death of the universe. So that's the Peasley papers. Um, but Strange Company, yeah, is my is my first short story collection. Awesome. And, and is it all new works in this collection, or is it some stuff pulled from other? Um, it's a lot of stuff. I would say it's about seventy five percent reprints, but those reprints are really hard to find. Like I think, um, what is it? Uh, Steampunk Cthulhu is out of print. A um, couple others are out of print as well. Or some uh, some some of the stories that I wrote for press books and uh, program books that were never widely distributed in the first place uh, end up in this book. But then there's about uh, I think two or three new stories uh, that have never seen the light of day. Nice. And uh, so those are included. Uh, so, yes, I'm trying to make it. Look, I'm a collector, and I one of the things <laughs> I hate is when I pick up a book and it's there's nothing in it that I don't have. And, you know, or what's in it is so what what new stuff in there is so little that I might not have even bothered. So I tried to find that balance of gathering up stuff that people might not have and then some stuff that is new. So, yeah, it's about, I think it's 20 stories. It's junky, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see, Strange come. I'm going to look. It's uh, The Final Days of Zer the Zircus Lavenza. Um, that was in, like, the Necronomicon uh Tribute book that Joe Pulver did. Mm. The statement of Orson Fletcher was from a program book. The annotations of James Ingraham Host that was from a a, a small press magazine that not a lot of people saw. Addendum to the report on Incident 2012-16. That is new. Um, I wrote that for a Chaosium. Um, Anthology that got canceled. Oh, that sucks. Yeah. Um, 
the unbearable uh, small press magazine. No, uh, an anthology that I don't think a lot of people saw. On the far side of the apocalypse is my first professional sale from the 90s. Wow, nice. And uh, I think it, it appears in a magazine called Tailbones. And it was anthologized in a anthology called Neverland's Library. But not a lot of people saw that. Um, the Thing She Left Behind uh, was published by Alan Kozlowski in uh, one of his, his uh, mini magazines. Um, oh, the dead, this, the last story in the collection is The Dead Provide, which I wrote in the 90s and literally sold three or four times. <laughs> and every single time, the project died. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> like the magazine folded, the anthology you know, collapsed and nobody got paid and never got published. Um, one magazine sent me a, a, a acceptance letter. And then when I inquired about what it was going to be published, they were like, who are you? Oh jeez! <laughs> I'm like, I, I had to send them their own email back, and they're like, "Yeah, we we've changed editors, and we don't know what's going on." And I'm like, "Oh god!" You know, wow. <laughs> yeah, but then finally, it was uh, published in uh, Gehenna Hymnam last year, and then you know it included in this anthology. So yeah, and and it's a good story. I really like it, um, but uh. I'm glad to see it get the light of day twice. Cool. And yeah. from the same publisher. From the, from the same publisher, yes. Very cool. And I, I guess that's one of the risks of, of small press is that, you know, from, from one week to the next or, you know, one month to the next, you really don't know, you know, how stable something like that may or may not be, you know. Oh, yeah. I mean, and it's one of the reasons I work with, you know, when I find people who do what they say they're going to do, I tend to work with them over and over again. Yeah. Um, it's hard to find people who can always deliver even when things go wrong. Right. I mean, I, so I wrote a, I wrote a story for an anthology and it lasted in limbo for like three years. Mm. And I finally said, look, I, you know, I, I need the story back. Right, right. And so I published that story in the Peasley papers. And then, you know, that was it. And I was happy. And then like six months ago, the editor from that original anthology, you know, sent me an email and says, hey, is your story still available? And I was like, uh, no, I used it. And he's oh, all right. Well, the, editor, the, the publisher only wants new stories. And so I was like, okay, but then like three months ago, the editor calls me up and says, I want that story. I don't care <laughs> if it's in there. because, you know, I don't know. I'm, am I your Cliff Clavin or, you know, <laughs> do you need me and everything to, to make you, you know, feel comfortable? Maybe, I don't know, John Ratzenberger is like in every uh, Pixar film. Right, right. Good luck charm, right? Right. Um, well, to be fair, you are in a ton of stuff. So, I, yeah. So, don't tell anybody. I only write so I can get my free copy. <laughs> because I'm gonna buy them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> if I can figure out a way to get a free copy, I'd much rather get a free copy. <laughs> Just then, you don't feel so bad if you don't get to it, right? It's, it's, exactly. it's a shame. <laughs> You know, you know, and the funny thing is that, you know, there's the stuff that I'm in goes to the bottom of the to be read pile because a lot of it, I, you know, it's, it's different now from when I started because my editors will often create a Facebook page for the project, secret, double secret probation, Facebook pages. 
And everybody who's got a story is, is talking about what they're doing. And by the time you get to the end, you kind of know what everybody's written. Yeah, yeah. So I want to read it. I want to read how you did it. But it's not a high priority because I know how it ends. <laughs> How, how much reading do I mean, you know, you're, you're writing and everything. How much reading do you get a chance to do? Uh, it's a good, that's, that is a good question. Um, so right now, um, because I'm working full time and I have a couple projects that I'm, I'm working on, I have three different things I'm writing right now. Oh, wow. Um, they're all interrelated, but I have three different things I'm writing right now. Uh, I read about a book a week. Wow. Holy crap. Um, but when I'm not working and I have a lot of, like I have the time off, like, you know, I had 10 days over Christmas. That's nice. Yeah. I think I read 12 books. What? Yeah. You know, like, cause you know, I had nothing to work on. So yeah. I mean, so um, for Christmas, I got a, just before Christmas, I got the proof of Mallory O'Mara's book on the, the lady from the Black Lagoon. And after Christmas, at Christmas, we had Christmas, and you know, you're up at five o'clock in the morning to, to cook everything, right? So, you know, I went to bed at eight o'clock, but I just sat there and I opened up the book, and I couldn't put that thing down till two o'clock in the morning. And I had to, fin I finished it, you know, six hours. Wow, it was really, it was a damn good book, but you know, and I just couldn't not finish it. So yes, that's the kind of crazy stuff that goes on <laughs> to try and, and and keep myself ahead of the game. Yeah, and it, in a lot of ways, it's binging. It's and it's not good for me, but it's functional. Yeah, I mean, like, I guess if you're not watching TV, or if you're not, you know, you're not playing video games, you're not whatever, like, it does, you know, free up some time. Like, I, I wish I had time to read more, and I'm always editing something or playing in a game or doing interviews. You know, I have my working yeah. full time, my kid, I'm like, shit, I, I try to read at lunch if we're not playing board games because we do board games at lunch. Um, but like two days out of the week, I'm, I'm kind of left to my own devices. So I try to read as much as I can. But yeah. wow, I, you know, it might take me two weeks or a month to read a book <laughs> depending on the book and you know depending on the yeah, size and, it, and you know some books are like this yeah. and some books are like this and you know for those of you on radio land i'm moving my hands back and forth. <laughs> uh, Dick, you know i'm not reading a stephen king book in in, in a week but you know yeah yeah, yeah maybe uh a, a mythos anthology you know uh, that's a week right um, if you can pick them up and put them down. That's what's nice, right? It's a bunch of short stories. You read yeah. something, put it down, walk back, you know, come back, pick it up again. Yeah. You know, I, I think I, you know, when I got, I was on a, I got um, a couple of years ago, I got Willem Pugmire's Centipede Press book, big, thick. And um, New York Review of Science Fiction asked me to review it. And they, but they said, okay, but we need it like next week. Oh, shit. So one of the comments I made was, please don't sit down and read this all in one sitting. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, it's like reading Ligotti. It's very dense. It's beautiful, flourishing language, but you need time to process it. And if, if, if you don't do that, you don't give the, the, the writer the credit he's due. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, there's, yeah, like I'm reading a lot of junk. You know, I, I read a lot. I, I I think you call I, I watch a lot of junk and I read a lot of junk. Because have, somebody has to. Yeah, yeah. Have, have you ever done one of the uh, like you know top one hundred list kind of things and and you know gone through like all classic literature stuff or no? No, I, I no. I have my I I have never ha not had a pile of books to read. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just, you know, um, as a kid and growing up outside of Philadelphia, we went to the Hors Horsham Bookworm like once a month, got like five books, 
and you know, always had a pile. And I've always, I've all, even through college, I've always yeah. had a pile of books to read. Um, at, you know, as a, as entertainment, not just because I needed to do it for work. Yeah. yeah. So, I, you know, I, I look at some of these lists and I'm like, yeah, I've read that, I've read that, or that. Yeah, that's in the pile. <laughs> <laughs> not sure I'm ready for that, you know? Yeah. Not really. And, and then there's stuff that's like, I really have no interest. I mean, I read, I think, one chapter of Ethan Frome. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm just not doing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, just, you know, I, I see what you're doing. No. <laughs> so I, I always fell behind, you know, during college too, because it's like it's so much other stuff to read plus work and a full course load. So I relish the summer that I could knock out, right? you know, I, I, a bunch of books over the course of the summer. Even if I was taking classes, you're not taking as many. And then I, you know, I started working through the pile and I got pretty much caught up. There's probably a handful of things back there I haven't read yet. So I'm like, ah, I'm going to do that, right? Like I've never read Moby Dick. I've never read, you know, whatever. I, and I tell you, it, it was, I, I did. I, it was one of the ones on the list. I read it and it was not as shocking, you know, 21st century as it was when it was written. But like the guy was writing a novel, like not in his native tongue. Like there's a lot of cool things that are happening. Right like historically to, to go along with that. Um, but I was really surprised. I read uh, Sense and Sensibility. I'm not going to say I love it. Like it's not my favorite book, but the use of language and, and this, like, I was shocked. I was like, wow, this is really good. Like I'm enjoying reading this. Cause like, you know, she's all over the, the, you know, the list and I'm like, fuck, let me just throw one in here and see how it's going to go. And I'm like, wow, this is really cool. Yeah. I'm always reminded of that, of that line in, uh, high fidelity where uh, John Cusack is talking about, you know, how he's educated. And he's like, I've read books. <laughs> I, I read love in a time of cholera. I think I understood it. <laughs> it's about chicks, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but no, but uh, yeah. yeah, it's like, yeah. No, but yes, but no. Right, right. We got something out of that, but that was not anyway. <laughs> That's not the takeaway. And for, yeah, but, but, but yeah, of course, it's just, you know, he's just acting, but yes. Right, right. Yeah, but I, I know people like that. Just to like cross, like I read, the, you know, I did the thing, you know. Yeah, I did the thing. I yeah. read. I think well, I read. And, and that's good, right? So, like, so that tells in their writing then, right? So like, you know, I've heard a lot of, of, a lot of uh, authors say, like, if you're not reading, like you're, you're not writing, like you, you, you can't write if you're not reading, if you're not well versed in the craft, like writing is an action unto itself, but like, are you, you know, you know, well versed in it, I guess. Yeah. Well, you have to know what other people are doing and where, yeah. you know, I, writing in the Cthulhu mythos, I sort of like, came out of nowhere and because I was doing something that nobody had done before. I was doing this big crash up novel and nobody had written a lot of, you know, those kind of novels before up until that point. Now I'm not saying that I started it because I think a couple people beat me to it, but now there's Lovecrafty novels everywhere. Uh, you know, it, Prior to that, if you wanted a Lovecrafty novel, you were looking at like Lumley, Campbell, maybe Stephen King, you know, if you stretched it hard. Elements, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, if you wanted a hardcore Lovecrafty novel, there, was, there wasn't that much out there. Joe Pulver, uh, Corey, Do uh, Corey Doctorov, not at that point, but Cody Goodfellow, A Radiant mm -hmm. Dawn and, and, and uh, Ravenous Dusk. But since then, wow, lots of stuff everywhere. And just trying to keep up with it is, <laughs> is a full-time job. I think Matt Carpenter is, is, has given up trying <laughs> to do it all. Yeah. You know, you know, but if, if, but I, to keep up to breast with what's going on in the mythos, I need to read a lot of it. 
and uh, it's coming out and it's first of all the easy stuff to find is everywhere it's the weird stuff that's you know that i really i'm hard pressed to find and i really wish we would see more of it i i love reading uh ken atmatasaro uh his japanese um mytho stories i've got some from south america i've got some from scandinavia um i see what comes across in amazon as being available in german and portuguese and spanish and i want it all yeah <laughs> and i but i can't read any of it right right um so i have to rely on what's being produced in english and uh it's still good stuff but i want to see what other people are doing because it's a different a different cultural or interpretation right. of of what we're so used to as is kind of one way right right um, i want to see who i want to see who's being subversive yeah yeah <laughs> well cody i mean all the time mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> i want to i want to see who you know and because you know when some of the stories i've written you know the uh here here be monsters ends with the idea that Cthulhu left, that he's no longer on earth. And all these promises that he made or his his worshipers interpreted were all crap. You know, and it, you know, so these and these are this is one of my earliest mythos stories. And it's it subverts the whole trope on its on its head. I want to see who else is doing that stuff and what they've done. Mm -hmm. Um because I want to play with, I want to play in that playground. I want to see, and I don't want to do what everybody else has done. Right? Is is there ever a fear with reading as much mythos fiction of, you know, subconsciously pulling elements that that other people are doing, and then like, you know, you get you get a part way into a story, like, ah, shit, didn't I read that somewhere? So uh, I think Matt Carpenter called me out on that. He, oh, <laughs> he, uh, he says that he loves my stories, the spaces in between, but it has the exact same plot points as something from Eldritch Space 2. Hmm. And I'm like, I read Eldritch Space 2. I'll have to go back and look at it, but okay, yes. And, you know, yeah, they're two different. They, they have this, basically the same idea, the same kernel. But they're two different stories. But yeah, they're they're very similar. But I don't I don't remember reading that. But yes, it happens. Well, it's um, bound to happen, right? I mean, well, there, there's so much room to maneuver, right? Yeah, yeah, there is. Um, but and one of the things that I have to be very careful of is that when I'm writing, whatever I'm watching or reading has a huge influence hmm. on, on what I'm producing. Um, you can walk through reanimators or the weird company. And you can pretty much tell what I was watching on my movie list by what's being dumped into as as side characters. I mean, the Thin Man shows up, Charlie Chan, um, the Maltese Falcon, all this stuff is everywhere. Uh, Night of the Living Dead, Return of the Living Dead. Yes, this is all showing up as little bits to to what I'm writing. That's cool. I mean, it's almost like a little Easter eggs too. Like yeah, there are little cool. Easter eggs. I mean, okay, so you know, um, in in my universe, uh, in um, Bolton, there's a, a Darrow Chemical Company. Uh, Darrow Chemical Company is the company that makes the chemical that brings everybody back in Return of the Living Dead, mm. but. Jeff Darrow is also the artist writer of um, comic books, including some Frankenstein work and some some uh, some Walking Dead stuff. Not Walking Dead, but Living Dead stuff. So it's a double entendre for me. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, yeah um, I do that kind of stuff. Yeah. So you know, in the in the the, the nihilism that's so ever present in in the fiction, right? Is that does that surround a, 
a kernel of hope, right? Like, so it's like we're so insignificant and things don't matter and, you know, we're just meat bags and whatever. But, but does that sort of promote the idea then of, you know, kind of living in that moment and being, you know, uh, you know, a, a good, a good person and helping out your, your fellow man, like that sort of stuff As we see, you know, people, you know, fight against these impossible odds in, in some stories and some stories, not so much, but, um, but, but to like, you know, this, there's nothing I can do, but I'm going like, we're going to do it anyway. Right. Yeah. So, um, in, um, reanimatrix that start, you know, Robert Peasley starts out that way. He has an encounter with, with what is essentially a, an avatar of the King of yellow. And, you know, he's very despondent. Um, and he has a hard time dealing with that, but he throws himself into sort of, defending the world against these things uh and and then sh uh, gives himself purpose um on the flip side i've got a lot of stories that seem kind of flippant um drake takes a hand is about a guy who goes in search of the a card game with the devil but it's not the devil, it's mythos monsters. And they're playing cards, but they're not playing poker, they're playing something else. And you're not allowed to watch, you, you have to participate. Hmm. Um, but he realizes that they're all cheating. <laughs> um, and they're all cheating so that they never win the game. Hmm. And, you know, so, you know, it's kind of a flipping story because it's sort of like, eh, it's a card game, but it's not a card game. It's It has bigger ramifications than that. Right. Um, another thing that, so so there's there's some humor in there. Humorous mythos stories go back, you know, a long time, but there's always dark humor. Uh, the Unspeakable Betrothal by Robert Block, where, you know, we wake up and the, the the woman's head is gone because you've been taken by the the Migo or uh, whatever. You know those little little humorous stories have always been with us. Um, but I do it seriously as well. Like in, in the Hall of the Yellow King, the humans are walking down this court, and there's deep ones and Migo and Yith and all these monsters just waiting for them to screw up in front of, of Haster. And they end up being the biggest badasses in the room, you know? And, and that was my point is that like, at one point they were, all these creatures were just low men on the totem pole. Sooner or later, somehow or another, they got to the top. What would it take to get there? And, you know, putting a mythos monsters into stasis, you know, a, a, an elder god into stasis is, you know, pretty badass. <laughs> it gives you immediate street cred throughout the universe. You're right. <laughs> um, but it comes at a huge price. Um, and, and you just have to be willing to pay that price. Yeah. It's a metaphor for life. It is. It is. <laughs> and, uh, well, you know, the times we live in now, right? No, let's not talk about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> is there? A, do you think there's there's um, a particular set of of, of um, I don't want to say circumstances, but 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 rules or whatever that determine? A, I don't want to say a good weird fiction story, but but weird fiction in general. Like, are there certain elements that we need to see? And it, you know, obviously, it's not tentacles. Um, no, it's, it's not tentacles. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, so one of the things that I've tried to do is I've tried to not bring a lot of mythos giants into my fiction. You know, it's, it's very rare. And if it happens, it happens off screen because I don't think that we're really prepared to deal with that. I, and I might not be prepared to deal with it as a writer. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very careful about when I do that. But this whole, you know, there's weird fiction and there's cosmicism and then there's cosmic horror and then there's Lovecraftian. And it's really hard to define 
what it, what we it is, but we know it when we see it, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, we know that Salem's Lot is a horror story, but it's not weird fiction. But Jerusalem's Lot is horror fiction and weird fiction. So what changed? And I, I think it's sort of like one of the things that I look at it is is this sort of anti anthropocentricism where you know so if we look at like Dracula and zombies and, and all this stuff the the, the standard tropes uh, mummies um, they're always after your soul the devil wants your soul you are important. The, the, the whole Lovecraftian thing and the cosmicism thing says you are not important. Your, your, your soul is not important. You are at best a meat snack. Um, so this, I think that might be part of the weird fiction definition that the main characters have to realize that no matter how important they think they are, they're really not that important in the grand scheme of things. And in fact, the entire human civilization might not be that important in the grand scheme of things. Um, there are uh, you know, other weird fiction things that I think are a reversal of some of the basic laws of physics. And, and, and this is where I, I play with what drives people insane. Because nobody, you know, we see all these movies where people are trying to show the mythos monsters now or the, some cosmic horror that drives you insane. And people are like, eh, it's not that bad. <laughs> yeah. But what I, what I try to talk to me is, is that it's not that the creature is horrible to look at. It's that its very existence violates the laws of physics that allow you to function as a, a conscious entity. You know, if Cthulhu actually shows up, it would warp space time around itself. And it's not the image of Cthulhu that drives you crazy. It's the fact that gravity is reversing and everything that you know is wrong. And you're seeing evidence of that. And you can't handle that. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And you know, so and, and this is like a a bigger version of the, the talk I give about Dracula, because I think Dracula is a very interesting story because essentially as a a side effect is proof that God exists for these characters. Right. You know, the cross works. So you faced evil. But in the process, you found out stuff. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. I never actually thought about it that way. That, that's right? Yeah. You know, so you know, what, you, what you see afterwards is, is p potentially some of those characters that, that were involved and then survived going off and becoming very, very religious because they've had an actual experience with true, tr something truly su supernatural and have seen proof that God exists. Even if it's just the fact that the cross repels Dracula. Right, right. That kind of Gnosticism, that, that experience, that can drive you insane because you now... You don't have faith anymore. Your your faith is gone. You have proof. And if that's a Cthulhu mythos proof, that's devastating. Right, right. Is you know, it's it's one thing to 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 sit back and think, you know, maybe I don't matter in the universe. But then to know that you don't matter <laughs> in the universe is a completely different problem. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, that's yeah, and maybe that's where Thomas Ligotti is. Um, but I, I don't want to be there. <laughs> I just want to think about it. Right, right. 
where where do you where do you see uh, weird fiction moving forward from where we are? Uh, do we see any great sea change one way or the other, or are we just? Yes, I think that we have no choice, and I think what we're going to see is a huge influx of female writers, um, a huge influx of minority writers, um, but also uh, an influx of writers who are of, of, when I say minority writers, I mean African-American, Asian-American, those right. But I think what we will also see is an influx of writers from Africa, from Asia, from South America, from the Caribbean, who are bringing their own sense of the weird to weird fiction. Um, and I really want to see what they do. And I, I see, we've seen some of it already with uh, Neola Hopkinson, um, Kenneth de Mastero, uh, Chigi Abaduzura. There's so many people who are we're just starting to see give voice to new ideas. I I, I really and I really want to read them. I, I want to read. An African, uh, not an African American, but an African mythos story. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to read one told from the from by a uh, Australian Aborigine. Um, one, I, I, the people in South America I know are churning this stuff out. I, I want to see it. Yeah, I said this before tonight. But I, I want to read these stories because they're going to be unique voices. They're not grounded in what we think we, is is a mythos story or a weird story. They're grounded in a completely different set of contexts, and they have a completely different set of cultural ideas. And one of the things that I, I do with my kids is we have. Um, we do a moviecation, you know, movie education night. Like you're going to watch this film because it's culturally relevant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's like what? And it's like yeah, you're going to watch. You're going to watch the Maltese Falcon. You're going to watch Psycho. You're going to watch Rear Window because they are cultural touch points. People reference them all the time, whether they know it or not. Mm -hmm. And you know, they watched Secret Life of Pets the other day, and there's a a bird's poster in the background. Oh, nice. So, you know, you don't understand that unless you've seen Hitchcock. So they need, I, I want them to have that education so that, you know, when they watch A Bug's Life, they realize that it's just Seven Samurai rewritten for kids or yeah. The Magnificent Seven or whatever, you know, uh, Battle Beyond the Stars. They're all the same story. It just changed a little bit. So we have those cultural backgrounds, those those touch points. <clears throat> but for people in other countries and in other continents, those touch points are completely different. And I'd love to see what they are and explore the influence of Marquez and Borges and uh, – more people than I could possibly imagine and people I've never even heard of. Uh, that's, you know, we are, the world is becoming connected faster and faster and translation is going to change. We can do translation very easily right now. We lose some context with it because it's, it's a word for word translation. It's not a, it, idioms don't translate well. Right. Um, but that will change as we as we move forward, and we're going to start seeing this stuff in our language, or we're going to have to learn how to speak somebody else's language. And but I think it's going to happen. Yeah. Well, we move towards you know AR and things like that, where you're just going to get all of that stuff on the fly. Like maybe we don't see that in our lifetime, but like you know, my kid, I you know, I think that that's 
I mean, it's definitely the direction that we're moving towards. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just hope that writers around the world take advantage of it. Because I, the, I, there are audiences waiting to see what they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's just it's interesting. Like you say, the, the, the touchstones are different. So just to kind of see, you know, how different it is to, to what we're used to. Right, right. It's, it's, it's just a fascinating, you know, counterpoint. It is. It is. And, you know, I'm seeing, I'm starting to see it right now because my Netflix is now full right now of horror movies from Central and Southeast Asia and India. You know, I, I love some J horror and K horror, but I had no idea that. You know, India was producing so much in the terms of horror films and horror soap operas, <laughs> um, but it's all there in my in my queue. I can see it. I haven't watched a lot of it, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know, it's there. And so, if people are doing it, I, I just have to break down and see, find the time. The the uh, and that's the issue. For every two hours that I spend watching a film, two hours I'm not writing. Mm -hmm. And you know, so yes, I have to sort of prioritize what I'm going to do. And uh, you know, I describe it in terms of: Am I a consumer or am I a creator? And I have to maintain a certain level of consumption in order to be a creator. But if I consume too much, then I'm not creating at all. Yeah. And I love playing role-playing games. Yeah. <laughs> I love playing role-playing games. I love Call of Cthulhu, Time Lord, um, Battletech when I could get, when we, people would play it, uh, Shadowrun, RuneQuest. But – one session, six hours. Yeah. We do about three because everybody's all over the place. What we do for the podcast, we normally go about three. But yeah. even three is a huge time investment, right? So, like, huh. it might be six for me. So, it's right after dinner. And, and my buddy Kevin, he's in the UK. So, like, it's three in the morning. So, when we right. get done, he goes to work. Like, it, it's just such a... Yeah. When I was in yeah, when I was in college, we would get we had we had we it was twenty bucks. We would go to the Chinese restaurant that opened at eleven o'clock on Sunday, and we would, we would get the back room and we would play Time Lords until eight o'clock at night. <laughs> nice. And you know, we just you know. Yes, there was an all-you-can-eat buffet, but we weren't really there for the buffet. You know, the buffet was convenient. We just really needed a, a place that we could all be fed and drink and play role-playing games yeah. all day, and nobody would kick <laughs> us out. That's twenty bucks a person. That's not bad. Yeah, no, not at all. That was you, lunch and dinner, right? <laughs> so, and all the all the soda you could drink. Right. That, do you get a chance to play very often now or no? I don't. The la I, I used to play with um, with Jim. Um, James. James. Not Jim. James. <laughs> uh, but I haven't in a while. I sat in on a game of, I think, uh, Arkham Horror at my local comic shop the other, like a couple months ago. But – yeah, yeah, the guy says, oh, it'll just be two hours. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> it took two hours to set up the board. Yeah, no kidding. You know, I'm just like, what the hell are you talking about? You know, you know and, I, I, and I think that's a really great use, use of time. It's not wasting time. It's, it's, it's good. It's enjoyable. They're great games. Um, but literally, I will get sucked into them and – not do anything else. <laughs> you know, I, I have an old Nintendo. I have the Wii. 
Yeah. And the we is old now, right? Yeah, well. <laughs> but um, given the opportunity, I will do nothing but play Mario Kart all day. Right. <laughs> Well, it's easy to get caught up in that, right? Like it, it's right. that mental, you got to clear that mental space to sort of like recoup and take a break. And it's just, it's so difficult to to ride that fine line of yeah. how much time do I spend decompressing versus how much time am I going to spend, you know, doing life stuff? And then how much time do I get to do the other things, you know, to, to create, to, to whatever, right. you know? And here's a good rule of thumb. If you can smell yourself, it's going to work. <laughs> well, I mean, that's fair. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, and, and Necro's coming up now, so we get to see in what? I guess it's about two months now, right? Yeah. Yeah, I've got my hotel room, and I've got my flights. And, and yeah, I'm really excited to go back. I love Necronomicon. It's I such love, a good time. Yeah. I love Providence. Um, there's a little monkey wrench in this year, but hey, yeah, uh, you know. So we'll see how how they cope with that. Um, All right. It's uh, um, I guess on Monday, the McCormick and Schmicks in the the hotel, the closed. Really? Yeah. Oh shit. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I, you know. Can you get another? Can you get another restaurant in your hotel in two months? I wouldn't think so. It's not impossible, right? I mean, everything's there, right? I mean, it's kind of like move in. You could do a pop up, right? You could just yeah. use everything that's there, and and you know, but but you're not really establishing a new restaurant. You're just you know, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. But that's where we did sea, the sea shanties. That's where we did um, trivia. Trivia. Um, it you know, I could get a burger at eleven o'clock at night because I didn't have to go down the street to any place. It yeah, was yeah. Right, right there in a hotel. Never mind that I'm a member of their club. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm saving all my points. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, it was a strategy. You know, now it's completely out. Of, but yeah, you know, we'll compensate. There, there's lots of bars. I, Blake's would probably be great for sea shanties down yeah. the street and past the convention center. Right. Yeah. We spent and, a lot of time in there. <laughs> yes, we have. We have spent a lot of time in Blake's. Um, but not. Apparently, we're going to be spending more. I'm, I'm okay with this. <laughs> You're okay with this. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I just, you know, I, I'm going to have to get some some healthy snacks for the room. That's all. Like, Yeah. And, See, I, I have Vince for that, right? So he drives up from Jersey. So I'm like, all right, bring me some, bring me some Valenzano wine because I'm too cheap to have it shipped out here. So bring that up and then bring, you know, stuff that we could like bring a bag of apples, bring – you know, peanut butter, peanut butter. Roll, for, roll for breads. Yeah. Yeah. Bring, bring those little tuna packets and stuff, just, you know, so we can eat kind of healthy because I'm probably going to drop about, Oh Jesus, 500 bucks on food and drink while I'm there. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's if you're conservative. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Um, not that it's not worth it. You know, I've had some really good meals in Providence. I've also eaten, you know, at you know, some really bad places that I won't ever go back. Yeah, yeah. So Blake's is good, but there's another Irish pub in the other direction that is right. really not so good. Oh, that one's not so good. I've never been in that one before. Yeah, it was like, uh, this burger is not cooked. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's bad. Yeah, it's like. <laughs> Yeah, this is not a Blake's burger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, is Necro like a working con for you, or is it more of a of a the social thing? I mean, you do your table and everything, but um, like like Gen Con is a working con, right? Like you're going there to make money. Like that's what that is for the most part. 
So one of the things that I have a habit of doing is that I bring stuff to sell. And I bring stuff that is relatively easy to transport, but has a high return. And I don't think that I have walked away from a con in the last 25 years with a bill. <laughs> nice. So because, you know, but that has meant, and then last year, uh, the last Necronomicon, it was obvious, I had to hustle um, and, you know, make some sales and, you know, trade up and, you know, um, do some down-home dickering <laughs> to, to get my wares sold and pick up the things that I wanted. Um, but yeah, normally what I, you know, when I've, I've, in the last, I think we've had three Necronomicons and like, um, the only thing I've walked away with is, is a air, air, airfare bill. Hmm. So, um, it's a working con in terms of me selling wares, huck string, hmm. but I have, I have, you know, it's, it's building contacts, it's building relationships and meeting editors and publishers and, I have a product that I need to show a company that's very large and powerful and I've been working on it for six months and uh, it's time to turn it in and see if they want to run with it or not. Right. So that's a huge conversation and I'll be drinking afterwards. <laughs> no matter one, way or, one way or the other, I'll be drinking. Um, because it's either, you know, it's it could be a huge commitment for the next two years or it could be you just wasted six months. But one way, yeah, yeah. Things 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 go weird. So but um, you know, I also try to enjoy myself. I am there to have fun. And I, I think we've we've taken over tables at Blake's several times now for really? several hours. And uh, and even in what was McCormick and Schmicks, we've had we had a table for a couple hours and just kept eating and drinking. And I think I sat down, had a burger, and two or three hours later, I was like, I'm "Hungry? Why am I hungry?" It's <laughs> hours later. <laughs> Time to have another burger. Yeah, right. <laughs> or, or something, you know. But yeah, so it's 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 both. I try, you know, and. So I think it was last year when um, the guy who did, I can't think of his name right now, the director of uh, Reanimator, Stuart Gordon. Yeah, yeah. Stuart Gordon was there. I ran around the entire con trying to get him to sign my copy of the novelization of that movie. And I failed miserably. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's like I could not, I could not make it to any of his signings. I made it to his events, and he would be leaving. I just gave up. I packed up all my stuff, and Monday morning I went down, and I sat down to have breakfast. I ordered my food, and I looked over, and he's sitting right next to me. Oh, jeez. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So it's like. Mr. Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, but yeah, so, yeah, that's kind of embarrassing, but, you know, it's like, okay. Uh, that was meant to be, after yeah. all that, you know. Yeah, you know, it's just like, I could see him. He's like three blocks ahead of me. Could not catch up with him. Yeah. Oh, you remember, like, the, the, um, the first con the first Necronomicon I went to, I was in a boot. Uh, I had worn my Achilles. It might not have been the year that I was there. I started going in thirteen. Okay. I had I had torn my Achilles and they almost didn't let me fly. And I'm like, there's no way in hell I'm not going to this. <laughs> you know, I've been planning it for a year. And yeah, uh, yeah and so I'm hobbling around the town with a cane and a boot, <laughs> and uh, was always on the wrong side of the road because you know the, the sidewalks were, were 
cannot leave her. Yeah. And uh, somehow or another, I was always like tilted sideways. They were <laughs> always on the wrong side of the road. And there's nothing like walking back from the bar district across the river, past the park with all the homeless people. In a, with a cane and a boot, yeah, and you're only moving at like two miles an hour. And you're just like, and, but then you make it back to the, the hotel, and you're sitting in the hotel restaurant, relaxed, drinking a beer, and some guy just starts comes by and starts pounding on the window to be demanding to be lit. In. <laughs> he's like, and he's got like spittle coming down his chin, and like, oh my god. But yeah, yeah it's all fun. It is. I, it's. I don't. Man, I don't think we've ever really had an issue, right? While we've while we've been there. I mean, depending on where you go, like you see certain things. But well, I think Willem got robbed, right? Oh and his, shit! Did he? Yeah, he, he, his wallet got stolen while he was sleeping. Oh crap! Yeah. But hmm. uh, yeah, but you know, and, and the. But you're right. Besides that, I don't think there's anything big deals. I think part of that is because of the, the way that they've organized their minions. They're empowered to do stuff. Yeah. It's like you're you're not you don't have to go ask anybody permission. If you see something that needs to be done and it makes sense, do it. We'll figure it out later. Right, right. And when you're out at night, I mean we're you know, you most people are usually in a big group anyway, so that right. mitigates right. that to a, a greater extent. It, it does. Yeah. And, and I, I have that night that I was wandering, you know, by myself with the in the boot. It turns out I wasn't by myself. Hmm. Um, Vince and everybody else was like half a block behind me, keeping an eye on me. No. Oh. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Cool. That, that that's gonna be fun. I'm I'm really looking forward to that. Um, it's coming up real quick. Everything we're all booked and ready to go. And I, I like for me, it's just it's you know I record uh, panels and you know we try to do content. Like you say, it's and, and kind of networking. We'll we'll try to schedule. You know, get some people in. You know, we'll, hey, when well, you know come on, we've got got some space and whatever. But like it's just a great place to go and hang out. The convention's not real big. Uh, you know, it's 2,000, 2,500 people, something like right. that. It's a really nice size. Everybody's, you know, everybody's friendly. Everybody's accessible. Like you're there oh. signing stuff. Cody's there signing up. Mike's there. Like, you know, nobody's unapproachable. Uh, I, I had a similar situation to you uh, the year that Peter Straub was there, which I guess was last year, the year before. Right. Uh, I br I'd carried around the book that he did with Stephen King. 40 pounds in my backpack and I could never catch him. So I got up like eight in the morning to go to the panel that he was at. So I grabbed them afterwards and he was gracious, took a picture, saw him yeah. look at everything. And he was, he was funny. He was engaging. Um, that, 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 that was a, you know, for a panel, right? Like it was, right. it was a really fun panel for whatever you want to say about those. But yeah, it's just a great, it's such a great opportunity to get to catch up with everybody. Yeah. And you know, it's only it's like you're in Arizona. I'm in Florida. This is going to be the place where we're going to get together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if people are out there listening, if you see me and I'm, I'm awake and I'm sober, and even if I'm not, feel free. You know, I might have to say no because I might be on the way someplace, but I, well, I'll make it up to you. But most of the time, you know, if, if you need something, I'm available. You know, you know, we we sit in the in the the Irish pub, and it was just me and Vince. And then next thing I know, it was me, Vince, and Chet Williamson, and uh, you know, people just kept piling in. And you know, yeah, we were all over the place, and we were having a good time. Yep. Um, yeah, that's definitely what it's about. Now, are you going to have copies of the new book at Necro? Yeah, I think so. I don't have any. I don't even have a copy yet. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm gonna have. I'll, I'm gonna bring a couple copies. I'm gonna assume that somebody else is gonna bring copies. But you know, I last time I sent up a box, it got really, really damaged mm. um, by the postal service. But um, 
I can't send a I can't send a Xerox box anymore. I'm gonna have to send something smaller. So limited copies. But you know, it's on Amazon. Just if if you want it, bring it. I don't have a problem signing copies I didn't sell you. Well, save me one. I want to get it from you. All right, all right. I'll bring one. I'll bring. Uh, I have. I'm, I'm supposed to get. I think twenty copies. And I'll. I'll try and bring ten. Um, I paid. I paid to bring a bag. So, you know, I can't. You know, we're old farts, right? We didn't used to pay for luggage. You're right. <laughs> I can remember when you could take two bags and a carry on and a personal item. And now it's like a carry-on, a personal item. Oh, and you want a bag? 50 bucks. Well, see, I think, well, last time I flew anyway, Southwest was still free. Was it? Yeah. 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 But that's probably been you know, since last Necro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I always check a bag when I come out just because I know I'm going to buy a shit ton of stuff and I need somewhere Ooh. to put it. <laughs> I have a friend who travels to London every year and she fills up her suitcase with clothing that she hates. And then she goes shopping for books and she fills up her suitcase with the books. Nice. All the clothing away. <laughs> just leaves it in the hotel. That's funny. Yeah. It's just like, never going to wear this dress again. <laughs> Don't want it anymore. So, yeah, and it's an interesting strategy, right? I very, I, I can see how it works. And then the clothes are probably going to like Goodwill or something, so that's yeah. not a bad thing, you know. Yeah, and then she, you know, she has a new wardrobe when she gets home. So, yeah, there you go. <laughs> that's a regular way to clean out the closet. <laughs> that's funny. All right. Well, I we're a little over an hour. I guess we we'll probably wrap this thing up then. Get you off the. Well, I guess we're not actually going to go to bed. I'm going to go to bed. I'm put my kids to bed, <laughs> and because um, they're missing me, I can see them in the I'm looking that way. And then there's a mirror, and I can see them at the top of the stairs. <laughs> right. That's awesome. online again. <laughs> Well, thanks for coming on. It, like I said, it's been too long, and I'm I'm definitely looking forward to getting the getting the chance to see you. So for, oh, first okay. round's on me. All right, well, I, I'll hold you to that. I I, I told uh, I told Scott the same thing. All so right. I, I owe you some beers or whiskey or something when we come out. All right, you know, we gotta get Vince to bring us something. He usually is good for a bottle of crack, and he brings it, and I bring my flask. Oh, <laughs> oh. I saw on Facebook Marketplace like a, an hour from me. This woman had a a a Kraken display stand. She wanted seventy five dollars for it. Interesting. I was getting in the car because <laughs> it was like nine feet tall. Oh, yeah. geez. And it, the tentacle comes out and around, and you. You put the bot, and I'm like, I gotta have it. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> and. And you know, I was told no. <laughs> you wrote, Pete, where are you going? <laughs> I was told no. And they're like, I was like, you can have it. You have to get rid of a bookshelf. Oh, oh, that hurts. Yeah. <laughs> Unfair below the belt. <laughs> yeah. it's like, I'm trying to figure out where to put more books. <laughs> That'll be my problem when I come back from that girl. I might need a new shelf. Yeah. So. All right. All right. Well, thanks again, Pete, for coming on. Oh, thank uh, you for having me. There are links in the show notes. So if you want to pick up Pete's new book or any of the other books, you can follow that Amazon link and, and uh, buy away. And if you can, please, if you enjoy the books, leave a review, leave a ratings. That is so helpful, not only for us when you leave reviews for us for the podcast, but for you know authors like Pete, uh, it really does a lot to to promote and that you know jacks up those algorithms to get that stuff noticed, and then Amazon takes notice, and then you know it's it's it, that's all good. So please do those things. Plus, it helps you know so I can buy a burger every once in a while. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thanks everybody for for checking it out. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. We'll catch you all next time.